<laughs> I feel so silly making this video, but <laughs> I'm Elle, and if you haven't been to my channel before, hi, I'm again Elle, and I make ethical fashion and YouTube videos here on YouTube, and today is the start of a new series. I have wanted to read Mexicana fashions for the longest time, and I was like, what better way to do so but by reading it out loud while in Mexico. So if you haven't noticed already, I have this really gorgeous background. I'm in Guanajuato in a small little town where my mom was born and raised, not born, raised. She was born in Illinois. Um, but she was raised in this little town and I'm on the balcony of this really amazing house enjoying the morning breeze hearing the chicken do the chicken things and people are out watering their garden they're out doing the thing so you may hear some background noise um, the birds are chirping the sun may be changing throughout this video but feel free to get a coffee <laughs> feel free to get a notebook feel free to grab this book if you have it i think I really want to make a little space for just a conversation of identity and self-adornment and politics, which is exactly what this book is about. And I'm really excited to take you on this like YouTube series and have you like sit down and listen to my voice. My reading of the book is not going to be perfect. I don't expect like quality audio all the time or perfect punctuation. Punctuation. <laughs> I can't even say that word. Um, if I mess up some words, just know that I'm just casually reading and I'm filming and you're listening. So if you want to follow along, feel, follow, free, feel free to follow along. I'm going to put the link to the book on where you can buy it down in my description if you haven't bought it already. I don't believe there's any ebook options, but I haven't checked either. But this intro has been long, <laughs> I know. but. This will be the intro for the series and hopefully you follow along. I'm going to be reading by chapter, so don't expect too many chapters in one video. I'll probably do at most two chapters in one video. i um, just going to be reading whenever I have a little bit of time. Um, so feel free to put your notifications on so you know when I upload the next chapter so you can keep listening and learning with me. So yeah, I'm really happy um, to explore this. And also I didn't explain, but I'm Mexican American and this is a deeply personal journey, I feel like, because a lot of our clothing has been westernized for such a long time. And I think that to truly decolonize and truly bring our power and identity and our sense of self back, we need to learn and to really explore what it means to be Mexican, what it means to ground ourselves in our culture. I, I think though that borders are fake, that national lines are concepts, but I do think culture and the traditions and the stereotypes and the generalizations do bring a sense of understanding to ourselves, especially if we've already internalized it from a young age, which I have. Um, and it holds an important part of me. And to really want to untangle the American side of myself, the Mexican side of myself, the westernized colonial aspect of fashion, and how I can get closer to who I truly am. Because sometimes I'm like, yeah, I don't feel Mexican enough, even though my, my parents are from Mexico and I'm from Mexico um, in a way because of that. And I think I'm American, but I also have this Mexican side to me. I was born and raised in Illinois. I currently live in Montana. So it's like, what side am I truly am? Um, is it one or is it either or is it all? Like, what's, what's going on here? So that's my personal reason of why I'm reading this, to selfishly self-explore myself, despite, despite understanding that, that these lines and cultures are just like mythologies in a way, but they do help us figure ourselves out, especially if they're so ingrained. What is that animal? Oh God, oh my God, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I just got attacked. <laughs> oh. 
Damn it. What was they saying? Oh. <laughs> Even if they're so ingrained in us, I think it helps us understand ourselves when we take a moment to self-reflect and to learn. Um, but yeah, this is just like a small part of our journey. Yeah, I just got attacked by an insect. Great start. <laughs> what even was that? It was going for my neck. Oh, okay. Without further ado, here is the reading book series of Mexicana fashions. <laughs> oh my god, I almost got killed out here. Okay, so chapter one, Wearing Identity, Chicanas and Huipiles by Norma Cantu. My mother, an accomplished seamstress, seamstress, taught me to sew on my grandmother's Celia's old senior sewing machine when I was seven or eight years old. As I grew older, I sewed garments for myself and my siblings, as well as for my friends. By the 1960s, I was also embellishing my clothing with intricate embroidery. In the 1970s, attracted by the textile art and design of the embroidered garment that has been worn by indigenous women in the Americas for centuries, I began wearing hand-woven wupinis. Ever since then, I have worn them, at first simply because I like them. As I learned more about the traditional garb, I realized that by wearing the wupin, I honor the artists who will make the pieces while, I, while I'm also reclaiming my indigenous identity. I was unprepared, however, for what happened in the mid-1990s at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. I was having dinner with friends and was wearing a wupin I had bought in Oaxaca. An anthropologist I had just met through a mutual friend chastised me, claiming that by wearing a wipin, I was insulting indigenous win women. While I took exception to such a claim, I was unprepared to offer a proper defense. I was simply stumped. This incident awoke in me issues of identity and race that led me to question the subject position of Chicanas like myself, mestizas whose indigenous roots have been erased, but who would identify not disidentify with indigenous women. By wearing the garment, Chicanas become part of the narrative of the indigenous people of this continent. For in some ways, wearing whippies is a kind of storytelling, a narrative that tells the tale of the wearer and the weaver at once. Seeking a theoretical framing for the analysis of such a narrative led me to, to testimonio as theory and politica as mythology. When working on the Latina feminist research group's book, Telling to Live, one of the goals identified by the 18 collaborators was to create new research methodologies that worked for us as Chicanas and Latinas, research that breaks free of the restraints inherent in our own disciplines, scholarly approaches. We came upon testimonio, testimony, as a way to create that new mythology through testimonio, wait, <laughs> through Testimoniando, testimoniando. Mm. We claimed our own process of creating a theory. As a result, a research praxis emerged. Later in my discussion, I address how through identifying a piece of clothing, in this case the would be as a narrator of a story, a testimonio, as it were, we can then speak of the narrative communicated of the story it tells. Hmm. In addition to using testimonio as a mythology for exploring the narratives of wipiles and wipilistas, the women who wear them, my research is based on platicas, informal conversations, rather on strict, strict and ethnographic interviews. I've been documenting and studying traditional culture in South Texas for over 30 years. So when faced with questions about my wearing wipiles, I eagerly set forth to explore other Chicanas' practice of wearing wipiles. Initially, I approached friends and asked for their stories about wearing the garment. Our platicas were sporadic and spontaneous. Later, I formally scheduled platicas with certain individuals. This chapter, based on selected platicas, seeks to present the findings as well as analyze the way wipiles function as identitarian markers. My central argument focus on, focuses on the wearing of the garment and the many spaces it occupies in the Chicana Im imaginary in terms of culture and identity. Specifically, the chapter focuses on my platicas with three Chicanas living in San Antonio, Texas, Rosemary, Cata, 
Carlos Graciela Sanchez y and Larisa Mercado Lopez. I first provide a historical context and define some key terms. Then I unpack some of the issues raised in the platicas. Finally, I explore the platicas slash narratives and analyze the salient points made by the wipiristas themselves. A core premise of this chapter is that for Chicanas, whose cultural ties to indigenous ways of being may still exist in culinary and folk belief practices, whose Western ways place us more in the realm of non-indigenous, we still self-define what part of the mestiza world to inhabit through wearing a penis and thus establish a link to indigenous cultural practices. History and definitions. The term would be according to Ellen Ro Rojas Clark, a professor of Mexican American studies, is a derivation, derivation, derivation of the nat natal, I'm so sorry, natal word upopi. I'm sorry if I mis mispronounced that as well, meaning blouse. The wipil can be worn loose or tucked into a skirt, called a quitel, and to say skirt and blouse, one can one said quitel wipile, which also is a metaphor for women. The wipil as a indigenous garment of Mesoamerica is easily recognized as a marker of indigenous identity. As Carlos Romero Giordano claims, each ethnic group has its own type, and while there are similarities in ways they are woven, their symbolism and their technique of wearing, dyeing, and decoration give each a special character. Historically, the Wipi's existence precedes the arrival of the Spanish. In the earliest codices, the glyphic writings of the indigenous people of the Americas, women wear them as they perform daily tasks. Moreover, remnants have been located in some archaeological sites. Various scholars have scored the codices to describe the way clothing marked status in the Aztec society. Um, George C. Valiant, an Aztec of Mexico, mentions that clothing marked sex, age, group, occupation, rank, and even the character of its wear. In 1948, Laura, Laura, Laura Strott and described the would be the Mexico and Guatemala, and noted how already a rapid spread of commercialization, commercialism and easier contact with the outside world is resulting in the adoption of Western type of garments. Jacques Sostel, the famed French scholar of Aztec civilization, similarly noted that the way clothing marked status in Aztec society. Patricia and Walt explores not only how it believes <laughs> what is going on in the background let me do a little brain, brain break what were we Patricia and Walt explores not only <laughs> with billets, but also other items of clothing, such as the uh, Gimtel, which is also worn by Chicanos and others. In my own exploration conducted in December 2014 at the exhibit Codices de México, Memorias y Saberes, at the Museo de Antropología in Mexico City, viewed codices that indeed portrayed women wearing huipiles throughout Mesoamerica. Among the main items on display was the early, was the early painting El Lenzo de Tlaxcala. In various depictions, La Malenche, Malenche wears a huipil as she acts as translator for the Spanish conqueror Hernán Cortés. The one-piece cotton, or sometimes wool garment, is handwoven on a back strap loom and is given an opening for the head. Sometimes it is sewn together to shape armholes, but most often it is left open so the two flaps are draped. The history of the garment non-withstanding, non we can claim that it is an essential garment for indigenous women of Mesoamerica even today, despite the fear that it may be a vanishing tradition. Mexican anthropologist Marta Duroc's work on Mexican textiles is noteworthy for examination of the origins of cotton and the natural dyes used since before the European contact. 
Her work also includes explorations into the reboso, the traditional shawl-like garment from the Nanzingo, and the danger the tradition faced of disappearing. Hmm. Oh, there's a little graphic here. I wonder what it's about. Lento de Tlaxacala. Oh, that's the image she was talking about. Well, many of the artists who create with Biles are facing increasingly difficult circumstances. They're in some ways forcing them to abandon their century-old art form. In some cases, it is the convenience of access to Western apparel that supplants traditional garb. One particular study includes an analysis of the impact of tourism on the sales of Wipiles and found that the two towns at the center of the study, Santa Catarina and San Antonio, competed for customers that both laid claim to the weaving tradition. While this is not the focus of this chapter, it bears mentioning that the Chicanas who participated in the study collect most of their Wipiles from Mexico and Guatemala directly from weavers and collectors and thus indirectly influence the tradition, albeit often unknowingly. Many weavers bemoan the fact that their dress is being commodified and the traditional ways are being challenged. There is fear for the future of the tradition, even as scholars assert that the Wipil will survive and remain a visual and signifying marker of the group, especially for special occasions. In a New York Times article by Larry Rother, an ethnographer and professor, Sherry M. Pancake expresses her fear that the tradition is changing and that we're going to lose the richness and variety of wupiles. She adds, that is not the same thing as saying that they are dying out entirely, but it's becoming less a form of daily dress and more of a badge. And I don't see how a tradition can flourish when it is relegated to export and special occasions. In the article, Rother points out that the tradition is in jeopardy due to decades of war and notes that changes in the tradition among the Guatemalan women who have moved to the urban centers. In her survey of Oaxacan textiles, Ruth Lechuga also notes the shift, pointing out that some communities have abandoned the wipid from blouses. Even as there are fewer wipilistas making the garment, there is a proliferation of wipilistas among young Chicanas. I tend to agree that the wipil may suffer transformation, but I am hardened because that is how traditional textiles seem to survive. Anthropologist Marta Duroc holds that another traditional textile, the reboso, has undergone innovation while retaining the traditional elements personal communication. And they has a San Antonio group of Wipil wearers and their collectors call themselves Mujeres de Wipil, Home of the Wipil or Wipilistas. The contemporary use of the term among the participants in the study applies to women who have decided con conciencia, with consciousness, to wear the garment and believe that by doing so they are by some way affecting the way it is being viewed by society at large. In my initial inquiry, I interrogated friends and acquaintances who were aware would be this, but not all of them were part of the formal platicas presented here. Many recounted poignant stories of how, as Chicanas, they identify with the indigenous part of their heritage and feel impelled to wear a wipil as a signal of who they are. One of these women, attorney Frances Herrera, tells of the strategically wearing the piece of clothing in professional circles to make a statement. As a former dancer with a local Aztec dance troupe, she wears it would be as a reference to her indigenous um, identity. In Cesar Martinez's film, Wapiles, The Fabric of Identity, several Wapilistas, led by Ellen Rojas Clark, present their views on the matter. Just as every Chicana who chooses to don the garment has a story to tell of her experience, so does the items themselves. As one of the Wapilistas claims in the film, every Wapil has a story. I would add that every Wapilista has a story as well. The fact that it is a so-called traditional piece of clothing adds to the complexity of the matter. For as part of the discussion, we must also deconstruct the very idea of what is traditional. I call for a self-reflection that will also explain how the adjective traditional connects with the, wo- with the noun tradition and how these contend with the fact that the very concept of what is tradition or traditional has changed over time Indeed, these terms may seek to solidify, freeze things in time, but the reality is that everything evolves and changes. Thus, the annual celebration for a Saint's Day or for a secular event like Memorial Day 
It's ever evolving and changing. The concept of traditional knowledge and cultural imperialism surfaces as key ideas in the discussion of dress as an identity marker. Though it be as a traditional garment may suffer the fate of so many other traditional dress traditions around the world, especially those in Europe, traditional knowledge then forms worldviews and belief systems, likewise is, as, as, is at risk. Dress and artifact that signals identity may be relegated to service as a nationalist symbol to be displayed at a town's fiesta or for national celebration and not for daily wear. The dresses of Philogorgo dancers is a case in point. They are based on traditional dress but have some stylized markers worn not only for Philogorgo performance. In many European settings in Asia, traditional garments have given way to compare contemporary global market ideas of dress. Um, blue jeans, for instance, appear as apparel across the world in what some scholars may call cultural imperialism, as is gone discussed by John Tomlinson, a signifier of what I'm likened to the soft power that influences popular culture and ways of assimilating the values and ideas of culturally, culturally hegemonic cultures. These concepts, cultural imperialism and soft power, in my mind, work hand in hand to shift identities away from the regionalist or nationalist and towards globalized markers of progress. Such ideas merit scrutiny for they are at the core why many Chicanas choose to wear repiles as a signifier of resistance and empowerment. Joanne B. Eacher, editor of a collection of essays on dress and identity, writes that the, auth that the authors of the essays she included do not see eth ethnicity as primordial or circumstantial, but rather rely on the dress as a visible mark of ethnicity. Traditional dress then becomes the site of contested identities that shift and more often than not displace the specific and place bound markers that situate subjects in time and place. Thus, the Chicanas who wear the traditional bil are in like fashion performing their identity and reclaiming the link to their past, their tradition. Their sense of community and who belongs to such a community can be further explained using Warner's Solar's, Solar's ideas. In his book Beyond Ethnicity, he claims that there are two ways of imagining community. He uses the term descent and consent to explain how one how one either belongs to a group by descent, having been born in the group, or by consent, having chosen to join the group. Serious critical scholarship of Mexican traditional dress has been mostly descriptive or historical, and some scholars, such as Marta Turok, have focused on the function of indig indigenous dress. However, hardly any scholarship that deals with traditional dress in Chicana X traditional culture exists. Yet, yeah, an increased interest in the analysis of dress in Chicanx culture and the performance in some forays into theorizing do exist. Florglores Dory asks Goldman in an article on the t-shirts worn by Chicano youth. It claims that they are artistic, ex artistic expressions designed to enable or facilitate Chicano self-determination. And she further examines how the images on the t-shirts tell three historias. A cultural history, a history aesthetic, and a history of resistance among hegemonic Euro-American culture. Similarly, Robert Naudosk examines the use of wrestling masks in performance to conclude that mass anonymity um, allows Mexican and Chicano performance artists to conjugate collective non-identities that face and performally efface the masks of nationalism. Chicanx theater scholars George Huerta and Yolanda Broles Gonzalez have looked at the use of masks and costumes in the plays by El Teatro Campesino. So the discussion often has often been relegated to particular performances, particular items such as the use of masks or particular events. Academic analysis of dress has also appeared as part of a larger analysis of dance, folklorico, for example or of popular cultural, culture dress codes, as discussed in Goldman's article. But such studies has not focused on the performance of Chicana identity that is wearing of clothing itself, nor on the complexity of that identity. Since the earliest mention of dress in the Mexican community in the late 19th century, 
little if any scholarly analysis has been done. One particular essay, however, does bring in the relationship between Wipides and Chicanas in her memoir, A House of My Own Stories from My Life. Stories, wait, what? A House of My Own Stories from My Life. Sandra Cisneros writes about her personal relationship to the garment. The foregoing discussion of key terms, concepts, and previous work on dress introduces my subsequent analysis of the wearing of abiles by Chicanas in San Antonio. As I mentioned earlier, my initial research goal centered on the question, why do Chicanas choose to wear abiles? However, this initial inquiry spawned a series of other intriguing questions around identity and the role of dress in creating one's identity. When did these Chicanas start collecting and wearing the garments? How do they feel when they wear repeaters? And how do, they, how do others receive or perceive their doing so? I saw answers to these questions by going to the Wipilistas themselves and engaging them in informal platicas. By delving into what the practice of wearing a pile signifies for Chicanas, we can explore the multifaceted signifier that is the Wipi itself. Wearing Wipiles, the body as contested space. Traditional dress has been at the core of much of my folklore work during the last 30 years or so. My research has focused on the traditional 15th birthday celebration, the quinceañero, on the dress worn by the matachin, matichin dressers and the wearing of habitos modeled on the special clothes worn by Catholic saints and other holy icons. In, hot, in costume as cultural resistance and information, which focus on the latter, I examine how traditional cultural actions often affirm an adherence to traditional practice, practices rooted in faith belief. Clearly, the use of abitos is tied to folk belief and a way to uh, and to a way of negotiating the very real material condition of illness. Similarly, my work on Chicanas and traditional dress, specifically my research on the wearing of certain colors for the quinceañera, reveals significant shifts as people re-territorialize and settle in the United States. Both of these studies provide a backstory for my current research on Wipiles. Folklore studies of dress and identity, such as the work of Jennifer Michaels on dress in Arles, France, and Dorothy Noah's on dress in a Catalan town, as well as others such as Elisa Arizons, are useful in considering my focus on the representation of Chicana identity. Michael specifically looks at a, at a European town's identity and its costume in terms of Solor's notion of descent and consent, translating the notion of the imagined community to that of identity. Michael's work is useful because she deconstructs the idea of who should wear a community's costume, tracing use of the local costume as a shibboleth in the French town of Arles from the 19th century to today. While Michael's focus on dress, while Michael's focus, while well, well, Michael's <laughs> focuses on dress, Noah's does not. Yet in her study of Batam, the Corpus Christi festival in the Catalan town of Barga, Noah's also distinguishes the complex relationship in com communities between locals and outsiders, especially in chapter three of her book, where she explores the idea of belonging. The notion of, be the notion of belonging is at the center of my discussion about how opilis mark identity. For the opilistas in San Antonio, the garment functions as a kind of chebolet to signal belonging. I venture to say that the same is true outside of San Antonio in wider circles, circles where Chicanas celebrate their indigenous roots. Studies of traditional dress in indigenous cult, cult communities help to explore the phenomenon, phenomenon that is the subject of this chapter, that is Chicanas wearing wapiles. Diane Crane opens her book on gender and fashion by stating clothing as one of the most visible forms of consumption performs a major role in the social construct of identity. The use of artifacts of clothing as a signifier to send a number of messages concerning gender, race, and ethnicity has been clearly noted in the case of Highland Maya women in Guatemala, whose opinions are signifiers of their identity. As J. Claire Oddland notes, from the wearer's apparel, one can deduce age, education, 
education, wor worldliness, financial and social standing, as well as the function, utilitarian or festive of the occasion. Impulses towards change are counterbalanced by intensity of conservative values and a strong sense of community identity and pride expressed in traditional dress. For many indigenous women in Oaxaca, Mexico, and Guatemala, the wearing of peles constitutes and it uh, constitutes an uh, identifiable link to their place of origin, as Morgadenes describes in her note from 1940. During the 1980s, when Guatemala was in the midst of a civil war and indigenous populations were persecuted, this practice became a dangerous act. Many Chicanas co coincidentally began wearing these garments ar around the same time, albeit for a different purpose. For Chicanas, the act of wearing mapiles became identified with political ideology and solidarity with Central American women. There is similarly between Chicanas' impetus to perform a political ideology and the t-shirts worn by the youth that Goldman studied. For Chicanas, such an act constitutes a claim on a recovered identity that transcends boundaries and is not place-bound. It signals an alliance and solidarity with indigenous women in the Americas, a political and ideolo ideological action that establishes a bond across borders. As Patricia's, Patricia Gonzalez notes in Red Medicine, the indigenous people among us are often erased and their knowledge negated. By choosing to wear traditional clothing, Chicanas reclaim an identity that has been erased. The indigenous through their clothing, they tell a story of who they are and affirm their sense of belonging to your group, to a community of women that is rooted in the ideological and aesthetic narratives of identity. In a sense, their personal becomes political. Everyone wears clothes, but not everyone chooses to wear certain items of clothing with a consciousness to make a political statement. The wearing of wapil nurtures and feeds Chicana's sense of self, even as it serves to signal political and ideological subjectivity. Hmm. Perhaps one of Mexico's most famous non-indigenous wearers of Wipiles is Frida Kahlo, who, as Genestrosa points out, wanted to portray her Mexicanidad, her Mexican cultural identity. She wants to feel part of the pueblo, of the people, and she did this through her clothing, mostly donning the Tijuana traditional attire. Upending the traditional notion of why people choose to dress as they do, Diana Crane notes how Simel sees fashion change as a process of augmentation of social elites by their social inferiors. She kind of choose the dress of those most marginalized, of those occupying the lowest rung on the social ladder, the indigenous women in Mesoamerica. There would be specific uses, and Mesoamerica differs from its uses as a garment in the United States. As anthropologist Nestro Garcia Gan Glini notes in his book Consumers and Citizens, the difference between Latin American and U.S. globalized societies extends to notions of what is popular culture and how consumers, including tourists, shape what is considered traditional. I offer one example of how the Wipid has gained recognition outside of indigenous communities as a referent for Mexican identity in the city of San Antonio, Texas. At a fundraising event in 2001, Hispanas Unidas, a nonprofit social justice organization that promotes, that supports programs for young Chicanas to raise cultural awareness and pride, used the Wipid precisely the word to raise awareness and celebrate cultural pride. As Elda Silva reported in the San Antonio Express News, for centuries, indigenous women in Mexico and Central America have created Wipiles using the means at hand to weave and embroider the traditional garment as a form of expression and economic survival. In part, that's why the Wipil is an apt metaphor for what Hispanas Unidas is trying to accomplish, says Selena Catal, executive director. I agree and further note that the Wipil may be used in various ways once it leaves the confines of an indigenous village where it signals n a number of subject positions including group membership. Morga Danes observes that it is easy to recognize Indians from the different villages in Guatemala because of the women's distinct wipiles. For centuries, the wipil continued to serve the same function and have the same meaning as it did in the pre-Columbian world. But during the 20th century, it became something else when it was picked up by figures in the arts, including Frida Kahlo. For Chicanas, the decision to wear the wipil is not just 
a result of aesthetics. Theirs is more of a conscious decision to reclaim their indigenous roots, to better understand this behavior and to support the idea that is a conscious and decidedly political statement, I turn to, prim to the primary method of my research, the simonium. As explained above, I was led to this mythology by the topic itself because the narratives, narratives coming from the wearers, the Wipiti says, and from the garments themselves, seem to be narrating a life story. Hello, it's me again. As promised, it is evening. It's 3.09. Well, it's kind of afternoon vibes. We just like went to the flea market that we went to. A lot of people. I'm like so socially drained. I'm like so ready for this book. So the part that I left off of was getting into a subsection called Fairy and Testimonio. So I'm just going to start right now. Um, at the core of folklore studies are the narratives we collect around artifacts and the narratives we construct to theorize around all traditional cultural performances. If we identify a piece of clothing, in this case, it would be as a narrator of a story, a testimonio as it were, we can then speak of the narrative communicative. The narrativeness of a piece of clothing as Goldman and Michaels show in their work can signal inclusion as well as exclusion. The testimonio, the testimonios that the Wipilistas tell become one with the garment itself. The complication arises in how Mesoamerican Wipiles have been strongly identified with indigeny, mostly in Chiapas and Oaxaca, Mexico, and in Guatemala. But Chicanas, as mestizas and therefore detribalized, can fall within the category or be left out of it. We are at the core a people whose cultural ties to indigenous belief systems may still exist in our culinary and folk belief practices, but whose Western ways place us more in the realm of the non-indigenous, the mestiza world. The erasure of our indigenous identity at the level of cultural knowledge can be severe for some of us, but the desire to reclaim it persists for we are aware that, as Anzandua points out, this land was Mexican once, was Indian always, and is and will be again. As noted above, Solores claims that there are two ways of imagining community. Consent, having chosen to join the group, and dissent, having been born into the group. Obviously, if there is no dissent claim, the situation becomes more complex, and the charge of appropriation becomes more relevant. The non-indigenous woman wearing a traditional dress is choosing to perform an identity that is not hers by dissent, but by her volition or by consent. Goldman also uses Solor's idea in her discussion of the t-shirts worn by Chicano youth, but she shifts the categories to fit her analysis. Similarly, I find that Solor's neat dichotomy does not work quite as nicely when applied to Chicanas wearing lupines. We are on one level choosing to wear a traditional marker of identity that places us within a community that is not necessarily ours, but at the same time we carry an inherent connection to that community that would place us within that group. <laughs> that is, we do belong to the indigenous community by descent, but as the tribalized indigenous people. Thus, we choose to identify by wearing the garment since we do not belong to the group culturally or geographically. A discussion of how detribalized Chicanas fall within the various ethnic categories of indigeny can serve as a segue to the next section of this chapter. In explaining the stance between indigenous and mestizo identities, I use Anzalduan philosophical views on belonging and exclusion from the hegemonic centers of Mexico and the United States by focusing on the representation of the garment in official public spaces such as museums and in fashion shows, as well as the ways that individual women wear the garment, we can begin to discern the dual role that would be that the Whippy has come to play in the imagination of the community and of the women who wear them. The Platica's method and practice. I now turn to a discussion of the Platicas held in San Antonio, Texas with my Wipil wearing friends Rosemary Catacalos, Garcelia Sanchez, and Narisa Mercado Lopez. Although I speak to other other although I spoke to other Wipilistas, I chose these individuals based on my personal acquaintance with them and my knowledge of their practice of wearing Wipiles. 
There, were, there was no compensation for their participation, and we met informally. La Plática, all but one of which were scheduled and conducted in the place of their choice, were recorded digi 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 digitally. The conversation with my then graduate student, Larissa Mercado Lopez, happened serendipitously when she was in my office. As we were talking about the project, she began telling me the, the, telling me the, the story of her first would be. Her participation added a dimension to the city that I had not previously considered age. The other participants were in their 50s and 60s. Here was a younger Chicana who had just been initiated into the practice and therefore, in my view, represented hope for the future. The pláticas took place in locations where the woman felt most comfortable and that had been previously agreed to by both of us. I met with Ro Rosemary, Catacalos, and Graciela Sanchez at their place of work. Catacalos was at the time the director of Gemini Inc., a literary arts center in San Antonio, and Sanchez is the director of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, also in San Antonio. All three participants identify the wearing of Wipilens with Mexicanidad. They also invariably identify Wipilens as markers of indigeny and all mention their solidarity with artists who make them. And so there was four central questions that helped us to stay grounded on the topic, even as we meandered and engaged in ref reflexive conversation. When did you first start consciously wearing wipiles? What does your family say about you wearing wipiles? What do your peers and colleagues say about your choice of wearing wipiles? Why do you wear wipiles? These very basic touchstone questions spurred other questions as the platicas ensued. All of the women claim that there is something very special about wearing a wipil. They refer to the feelings elicited by wearing them and to the sense of identity wearing the garment brings. It makes me feel powerful, connected to their identity. Oh, it makes them feel powerful, connected to their identity. In the following section, I analyze the Wipurisa's answers individually. Rosemary Catacalos, who identifies both her ethnicities, Chicana and Greek, said, As a child, my family would send me the tiny wipiles from Yucatan. My grandmother was always teaching me Mayan and stressing that part of who we are, but consciously, not until the 70s, I think. Obviamente, obviously, we were political at that time and it served as an identification, visually representing who we were but it gets complex to me because of the Greek. I also, I was also wearing traditional dress from Greece during traditional Greek folk dances. For Catacalos, then wearing wipiles was a practice that preceded her consciously choosing the garb for identitarian, identitarian purposes. The fact that she was also doing traditional Greek folk dances raises the issues of how mixed ethnicity plays out in many Chicanas lives. In terms of what wearing the whipping means for her, Catacalo said it means connection to her maternal family. She, strategi she strategically wears the garment. It's a protective garment for me, very, con very strong connection to my grandmother. I feel I have with me when I wear traditional dress. If I'm unhappy or down on a particular day, I put on the whipping. When I need strength, for example, I wear red whipping. It's more about an internal relationship than with what is out here. It's not unusual to have clothing and color provide a sense of well-being. Catacalo strategically uses the garment to empower herself emotionally by identifying with her grandmother, but by finding the right color, she adds to the emotional benefit. She also expressed a desire to talk more about her wipiles, ha about what her wipiles, wipiles have been used for. Curtains, tablecloths, throws on the bed or couch as art work hung on the wall. <laughs> um, she does not judge it. Inappropriate to use the wipiles in such a way, adding, there are women's work. It's common on the reusing of pieces of things made by women's hands. And discussing why she wears the garment, Catacalos returned to a common theme expressed, expressed by most wipilistas their fascination with textiles. All textiles fascinate me in the most profound way. It is women's work. Catacalo explains, she also referred to an exhibit she saw. 
A while back, El Banco de México had a show of women's huipiles, and the women had embroidered the stories on the huipiles. The idea of narrative attracted her because it connects to her keen interest in textile and words. As a writer, she can identify with the need to transmit a story. Talking about why she wears a huipil, or why she wears huipiles, she brought up a point for discussion. Another thing is how gringas wear them. She then went on to discuss the preparation of the garment by outsiders, non-indigenous and non-chicana. It's a long tradition of gringas who wear, who grew up in a certain class level back in the 60s. It felt less than inauthentic for them to wear them. To deconstruct all of the issues that Catacalos raised, especially regarding who wears huipiles and how they're appropriated, you can begin with the idea of what, it, what is being called cultural plagiarism. That is the barring of traditional cultural artifacts by designers for their own lucrative ends. Unlike the cultural imperialism that, impose, that imposes the developed world's fashions onto developing nations, in this case, fashion houses are using traditional designs for a hot couture. What comes to mind is the controversy surrounding the use of the design from the indigenous mixes in Oaxaca by French designer Isabel Morant for a dress in her 2015 Atoll collection. The issue is not just the taking of a product that is, clo that is closely identified with an indigenous group whose identity is bound to the design, but it is commodified and exists in the marketplace far removed from the community of origin and for the profit of those who have no intention of honoring the original creators of the design. Hmm. Unlike the controversy caused by the, uh, by the appropriation by celebrities such as Selena Gomez and of the Bindi, the or ornamental dot placed in the forehead of Hindu women to signal marital status, the use of Wipil inspired fashion has monetary consequences. Cata Carlos also spoke of her predilection for the Wipil as daily wear at work and for social functions claiming that wearing it gives her a sense of self, a connection to her cultural antipasados, her ancestors. Graciela Sanchez also wears with Pines with a definite political intention and often wears garments that men would wear. She acquired, she acquired her first Wipil while traveling in Mexico, and that is where she still gets them from the actual weavers, the artists. She speaks of her allegiance to these artists and how, through her purchases, she ensures that the tradition remains a vital part of life for them. She also acknowledges that she has received some hupinas as gifts. Sanchez re reiterated a sentiment I had heard repeatedly. We honor the woman whose labor produces such beauty. She also mentioned that through purchasing and wearing the hupinas, she is resisting the mass-produced items that create sweatshops. Furthermore, she expressed her solidarity with indigenous and marginalized communities. When she wears her repeal to a city council meeting or when she appears before TV cameras during a press conference, she feels that the repeal sends a visual message of what her work as an activist is all about. I was not surprised to learn that as a queer Chicano whose life's work has been to confront social justice issues in San Antonio, she often wears men's wipiles or tops and thus also expresses a critique of gender and sexuality through her clothes. Most wipilistas, not just the ones in this brief study, feel that wearing the garment is an affirmation of their identity and all its complexity. They use it as a signifier of that identity and wear it con conciencia, with awareness of what it means. Sanchez's response is emblematic, emblematic of how most women who wear wipilis respond when asked why they wear them. That is, they cite the beauty and the aesthetic quality of the garment, as well as its significance as a marker of identity. Sanchez further discussed its appropriation. She sees the concept of cultural genocide playing a role in undermining Chicana's sense of self. For her, the garment as exhibited or worn plays a role in what she observes is the result of a hegemonic critique of Latinas, the hating of ourselves as women of color, as dark-skinned women, as indigenous linking mujeres, as women with accent, accents, and of course, the mestizaje of all of us. 
the hegemonic powers in fashion and elsewhere normally erase the traditional practices unless they can be adapted, appropriated for commercial purposes. The social context where the Opiris exist in indigenous communities. Was it Limpior? Wait, Vina Vina Say hi. <laughs> the social context ex con the hegemonic powers in fashion and elsewhere normally raise the traditional practices unless they can be adopted, appropriated for commercial purposes. The social content context where the Lupin exists in the indigenous communities, the marketplace and the fashion industry determine the relative value given to the garment. Moreover, moreover, all of these factors impact the value given to the creator or artist whose work, the weaving and embroidering, results in the unique creations. Chicanas, by choosing to wear repeaters, impact their creation as well as the artists. They claim the garment as a signifier of indigenous identity. And they choose to wear it as a referent to uh, as a referent to their ethnic identity, albeit one that has been often denied them as mestizas. Now we have Teresa Marcado Lopez, uh, was described as a, as a doctoral student at the time of our plática and just received her first wapil um, as a gift from a fellow student. She loved it and said she planned to buy more. And she spoke of her admir admiration for the weavers and the art involved. I followed up with her recently to find out if, to find out if she had indeed acquired more repeaters and if she still wore them. I also posed the same questions from our first platica and she responded with some updates, especially regarding her current position in academia. Mercado Lopez spoke up, brought up an important po point, one that no doubt impacts the purchasing choice of young Chicanas, especially students. Repeaters are often sold for hundreds of dollars. She mentioned their costs in the touristy shops in the hyper-commercialized Mexican Mercado in San Antonio as a deterrent to not having brought, bought one herself before. I was not surprised to learn that when Mercado Lopez wore her rupee to the mall in San Antonio, she was met with a few curious looks because rupilistas often experience that reception. In fact, almost all of the participants in my study told of similar reactions, especially from people who do not recognize the garment. Further, when Mercado Lopez wears her repeats and the Mexican blusas, blusas, blouses she likes to wear, her family thinks they are cute. She further clarifies this comment by positioning her own identity within her family and their symptoms of her politics and, and identity. I think that I am not questioned because they have always known me to be invested in my culture. So for them, the Wipilas seem to be more about asserting an authentic identity. As to wearing the garment at work, she said, My peers and colleagues are in women's studies and Chicano studies, so they are very complimentary when I wear Wipilas, as they have more of a consciousness about the politics. There are very few of us who wear them in Fresno State. In fact, besides me, I can only think of one other Chicana in literacy and a white woman in anthropology. Fresno is politically conservative, so I imagine that there may be resistance to wearing repeaters because of the imagined stigma. Underscoring that Fresno is politically conservative obviously signals that the spaces where one wears a repeat affects how it is received. Similar to Sanchez's comment about strategically wearing the garment, Mercado Lopez also wears with beads as a form of resistance to colonization, imperialism, and capitalism. She adds, I wear them when I am going to the meetings so that my politics are understood immediately. I wear them when I am going into meetings so that my politics are understood immediately. I feel that when beads disrupt this space in many in ways that encourage people to be conscientious in their words and ideas. In addition to this, she wears them to teach, and like others, she claims that the mere act of donating the Wipin empowers her. She said, when I know that I'll be teaching a particular rough subject, I wear it be for strength and to remind me to teach in ways that decolonize. A close examination of Merca Lopez's forceful statement reveals that even though she shares sentiment expressed by the others, especially Sanchez, she seems to be more aligned with a political identity 
that the garment signifies as a Chicana feminist. Regarding when she wears bipides, she said, though I wear regular clothing most of the time, I most often wear bipides to teach to cultural events and to community meetings. She added, I also wore the gauzy Mexican blusas when I was pregnant and nursing because they allowed for more room. Mercado Lopez, like other participants, is fully aware of the impact her clothing choices have and the way she's perceived, and further establishes that wearing a bipide affords her sense of power, vice a vice the situations where she must negotiate her identity as a Chicana. Conclusion When a Wipita remains grounded in its more traditional meaning in the indigenous communities of origin, it also has morphed and shifted into signification into a new terrain, in this case the United States, as many Chicanas claim it as their own. Garcia Canclini asserts that globalization diminishes the importance of the foundational events and territories that supported the illusion of ahistorical and self-absorbed identities. I contend that indeed the complexity and shifting identities of the women who are repeals in a globalized world can be destabilizing. He continues noting that in the late 19th in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, identitarian references are shaped not by the arts, literature, and folklore, which for centuries gave nations their distinct feature features by the textual and iconographic repertoires furnished by electronic communications media and by the globalization of urban life. While I concur with this general assessment, I underscore the fact that Wibiles rooted in folk tradition are still woven in backstrap blooms and are still signaling messages of identity. In this instance, the referent arising from the folk textile tradition shifts into textual and iconographic repertoires for Chicanas in the United States. The women who participated in the platicas all agree that the garment fulfills a need for them, the need for comfort, for beauty, for a way to wear their identity. It is indeed functioning as a marker of identity and as Riojas Clark says in the film, Lupita is a fabric of, of identity, they identify the garment as a connection to their heritage. Their Lupita has traveled along a path yeah, you're chronically and thus has transcended the class borders that confined it to a particular segment of society in a particular geographic region. Yet it remains synchronically tied to that earlier space and remains the visual semantic value to signal the indigenous in spaces far from its villages of origin. We can assess its trajectory. By focusing on the Chicanas who wear the garment, I sought to find answers as to the text of their self-authoring. Indeed, in all instances, the platicas reveal that Wupilistas not only care about their own subject position, allied to the cultural bonds to Mexico and all things Mexican, but also they, they see a link between the indigenous women who wave the Wupilis and their own wearings of the garments as Chicanas in the United States. Further, they affirm that wearing the Wupil is a political act. After considering the ways that the Wibir functions for Chicanas, including the very personal and identitarian use, it seems clear that the garment is not about to die out as some fear and that, at least for the time being, Wibiris will continue to be made and worn. As anecdotal evidence, I submit the phenomenon I observed recently at the annual meeting of the Mujeres Activas in Letras y Cambio Social, the professional organization for Chicana, Chicana and Latina feminist scholars. A quick head count at the opening ceremony in the courtyard outside the meeting place at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque revealed that well over 50% of the hundred or so attendants were wearing some kind of blusa or pil, the signal to Mexican that granted that the venue and the circumstances, after all, um, Mujeres Activas and Letras y Cambio Social members tend to be students and academics who work in the field of Chicana studies, but tend to draw Wapilistas who don the garment as a piece of daily wear. Perhaps the oldest member in attendance, Octo Genieran, Octo Genarian, Octo Genarian, Enes Talmantes, a professor of religious studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, was wearing a beautiful wipir, the fiesta from Chiapas. The wipir was obviously also a favorite garb of many of the young scholars, students, and community members in attendance. And in addition, wipiles were being sold in at least two of the nearby vendor booths throughout the conference. 
Such a place and symbolic use of traditional garments by Tikanas affirms my thesis that the Wipir functions, functions as a signifier of identity and that Chicana, Chicanas choose to wear it for very specific reasons, con conciencia. With the Wipir, oh, well, the Wipir survived the onslaught of inexpensive writing made Western clothing in its home communities. The market that Chicanas constitute may not be the decisive factor in the survival of the tradition, but just as collectors' interest has influenced the prediction of the garment, the fact that Chicanas are buying and wearing with pilas may also possibly positively impact the industry. In a lecture delivered at the Mexican Cultural Institute, Turok noted a similar impact on the Reboceros in Denancingo in central Mexico. The Wibir, like the Reboso, will survive as it has for at least a century and will continue to be worn by the women and indigenous communities as well by those of us who seek to reclaim our indigenous identity. For now, I predict that weavers will continue to sell to tourists and others who favor handmade natural fiber textiles or machine-made mass-produced fabrics. But given all this, one question remains. What will happen when the weavers' children move to the urban cities or perhaps even to the United States and stop weaving the fabric in the traditional way? Who will weave the cloth for the garment? Who will carry on the tradition? That is chapter one. We've gone through a journey for it. If you've stayed the whole time, you've seen many different angles and many different moments and now you're just listening to my voice to some like video but let me know in the comments what you learned and resonated with the most in this chapter. I would love for you to explore anything, all things that I mentioned and are read in this chapter. And look forward to chapter two. May the sun not be that bright. May the battery not die so fast. And may the chapters make a bit more sense. <laughs> Alright, stay safe. Bye.